Today, I'm going to share with you uh, some, uh, well, an outline of a project that I've been working on with my good friend and colleague, Claudio Celis Bueno, who is unfortunately unable to join us today. Um, and this is a project that we've uh, quite literally just started working on since um, April this year. So we're still in the kind of uh, field work, you know, data collection phase, but I will share the outline of this project. I will share so, um, a bit about um, our questions, our curiosities, but also some preliminary findings. And this th is a project about um, algorithmic decision-making, creativity, and the movie-making machine. In essence, we are very interested in, you know, the new AI tools that are popping up every week now. Um, and we're looking specifically at its impact within the film industry, and particularly within the kind of production context of um, of filmmaking. And I know that in this seminar series that Paolo and uh, Katerina have uh, uh, organized, you know, we've been hearing a lot about recommender systems, about streaming platforms like Netflix, um, the sort of distribution aspect, the, the reception context of this. So our project is sort of shifting the focus towards production in a way. And we think that's really interesting because so much is happening in this space. And for us, this is a project that is um, a first step toward, uh, towards a much larger program of work looking into the impact of AI tools in the creative, uh, cultural and creative industries. So today I'm going to, this talk will be <clears throat> sort of structured in three parts. I will first talk to you about the ghosts in the machine, which is to sh share with you some of the tools that are out there that filmmakers are now using in, in the production context. Uh, we're going to, I'm also going to share with you some of our thoughts on creativity because we are interested in how these tools will impact um, creativity and creative labor. So we want to ask the question, you know, what and where is creativity in this? And the last part will introduce our, <clears throat> our empirical work and some preliminary findings, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, <clears throat> so what's going on in film today? Um, first, we need to look at what went on in film before. Uh, this is a nice quote from Michael, uh, sorry, yeah, Michael Pocconi and John Sedgwick writing about um, the financial risks within the film business. So I'll read this quote out. It is impossible to predict on a consistent and regular basis which of the hundreds of annual film releases will turn out to be profitable, the process being to all intents and purposes an apparently random one. What they're describing here is very much the process of uh, production. For a producer, you know, they receive screenplays on their desks, right? If you're a producer in a big film company like you know Warner Brothers and so on, you're receiving hundreds of different film ideas and screenplays. And the challenge here is to pick the gem, right? Which of these screenplays will become a box office hit? Because that's what you want at the end of the day, right? You want to be able to pick um, a story that will really um, attract audiences. And this process of selection, this, this kind of decision making is, for now, still a fairly apparently random one. Um, there is no consistent methodology, but now we are in an age of AI, we are in an age of um, algorithms. And so the AI tech industry has come to the rescue, right? You've got a problem, no worries, we've got an algorithm that will help you. So now, Apparently, there is a consistent and regular method by which producers, you know, filmmakers and film companies can uh, select a box office hit out of the different film ideas that they, uh, that they receive each week. Um, and so this is worth uh, raising now because we need to remember, and I'm sure our audience here is fully aware of this, the film industry is is a business at the end of the day. We're talking about millions of euros, hundreds and thousands of dollars with, uh, in the production of, uh, of a particular film project. So you want the green lighting uh, decision to be 
the right decision. Um, before the time of algorithms, right, it was a process that was fairly based on gut feeling, right, based on a producer's, um, you know, years and years of knowledge of selecting stories, of having a good sense of what people are really responding to, what kinds of stories audiences may may uh, like to watch in the cinema. Now this gut feeling is being enhanced by AI. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is about five years back, 2018. This is a time when we are seeing a lot of news articles in the trade press and in you know, places like the New York Times about how AI is now coming to the movies, right? not just as a, as a character or within a story, but in the production of movies. So here we have a New York Times headline, um, lights, camera, artificial action, the startup is taking AI to the movies. AI could one day determine which films get made. 20th Century Fox is using AI to analyze movie trailers and find out what film audiences will like. Now, AI can predict if a movie is going to suck. And in Forbes, Hollywood is using AI to pick its next blockbuster. Um, these are all very sensationalist, you know, headlines, um, eliciting a bit of fear on some part, right? Because now it, it, it all ties in with this whole idea that AI is going to take away our jobs, right? AI is going to ruin human creativity. It's now going to you know, take over the production of culture to a large extent. And uh, these headlines were really kind of a little bit preying on that fear, um, preying on that kind of uh, uncertainty about what this whole AI machine learning thing is for the general public. Um, and it was, it, so these are the companies that, um, that we've been looking at that we are very interested in. And these are the companies that sort of have come to the rescue in a sense. Um, the discourse surrounding, surrounding the emergence of some of these companies is very much that of technological solutionism, right? That anything can be solved with technology or anything can be implemented and boosted uh, with technology. So this is a, you know, one of the headlines from uh, Lago, a Swiss company, and they're going to combine your gut feeling with artificial intelligence. Um, and what these companies are doing is to kind of solve uh, parts of that problem that Michael Pocorni and John Sedgwick described earlier, right, which is to offer a solution to help us or help producers find the next big office uh, box office hit and how to make this process faster, more streamlined, more efficient, uh, more accurate. So what I'll do is to very briefly um, introduce some of these companies to you and tell you a bit more about what they do. And we can kind of uh, divide these. These are not the only companies out there, obviously, that are using AI, but there are lots of other tool makers and startups that have introduced all sorts of um, tools that fall either into the generative AI camp. Um, and that's where, you know, you're using uh, machine learning, uh, large language models or uh, various sorts of specific technologies to generate images, generate text, generate ideas. Um, that's generative AI. And on the other hand, we have the companies that are catering more to the analytics part of things, um, companies that support you know, data intelligence within uh, the film production, the film business. So uh, one of these generative AI uh, companies is Runway. It's a startup that has made quite a lot of um, headlines recently. Um, it has, they have produced a tool that can help you do everything you need, right? It will support you in everything you need to make anything you want. Uh, a huge claim indeed, but you know, they're a company with really big ideas and, and uh, people are actually really, really excited about uh, the tool that they have offered, uh, it's called Gen 1 and now Gen 2. Um, you can try it for free, play around with it. Lots of filmmakers have been playing around with it. Um, you can see on the left here, there's a kind of list of the different functions that their, their um, platform offers. You can generate videos, you can generate images, 
uh, using prompts, of course. Here you can see an example of how you could infinitely expand an image. So if you upload, for example, you know, this picture of a, a bird on a branch, you could potentially fill in uh, and make this image much bigger. Uh, you can reimagine any image in any style you want. You could turn this into a kind of film noir kind of image, uh, change the aesthetics of it. Um, you can erase things from the video. You can change uh, the pacing, the rhythm of any kind of video, existing video. You can make images move, animate still images. So lots of really fun things to play with. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, it's something that could be really potentially uh, useful in, you know, the generation of graphics, right, or visual effects, for instance. Um, and this is all based on um, sort of AI, <laughs> AI magic tools, as they say here. So Runway is one of these uh, generative AI companies, and uh, again, lots of others out there that deal with images or text. Um, on the uh, Data intelligence side of things, we have companies like uh, Synalytics. So this is uh, an American company uh, who, which was founded by an ex-NASA rocket scientist. So he's bringing his risk management knowledge and expertise from rapid rocket launches to the film business. So as you can imagine, that's a huge selling point, right? accuracy of data, um, you know, very strong sort of predictive analytics are embedded within their platform. Uh, what you can see here is that, you know, you as a, as a film producer, what you do is you upload a screenplay, you upload as much information as you can about a film project, you know, the running length, the genre, uh, even the casting, if you already have casting ideas. And the platform basically spits out uh, a prediction of how much your film will earn in the domestic US box office, but also potentially in China and Germany and the UK, uh, rest of Europe, you know, how much it's going to earn, uh, when would be the best time to release the film, to how many screens, uh, which distributors would be, you know, a good fit. Um, it will even, you could play fantasy football with this too, right? You could swap out uh, Jeremy Renner and plug in, I don't know, Tom Cruise or Keanu Reeves, and you will see how much more the film will earn or how much less the film will earn if you substitute it one actor for another. Um, <clears throat> there is, um, yeah, so all these different analytics are sort of presented in a very nice visualization, very nice dashboard here. Uh, what the tool does is to kind of mimic the workflow that already exists in film production, um, as you can imagine, right? All, the, all of these things are already being done, but what they offer is speed. So this could all be done within a matter of hours um, and accuracy, right? It can more accurately predict uh, the box office performance, Right. or you know the the box office performance based on the talent or the the um, choice of casting and so on so it's mimicking existing workflows but enhancing it boosting it with data um largo the next company so this is the swiss company that i mentioned it's a startup that was a i think a spin off from a university setting so Similar things, right? You you upload uh, footage, you upload screenplay, you upload all kinds of information, um, all kinds of input, and their platform spits out analytics. Um, so fairly similar to Synalytic, but uh, they also have this uh, very nice genre recipe, they call it. So it shows you at which point in the film there is, you know, more action or comedy or crime, uh, whether the drama element is stronger in this moment compared to that. And this for um, writers, for example, is, you know, potentially quite a handy tool. And there have been testimonials from European uh, producers and screenwriters saying that it was nice to see their 
film, you know, represented in a very different way, because then now they can see patterns and flows and maybe tweak the story a little bit so that in the, the middle, middle part of the film, there's, you know, less comedy, but more drama, or they could make the ending, change the ending based on this, um, this sort of uh, genre recipe uh, analytic breakdown. There's also a, a casting sort of a suggestive casting uh, bit here. So here you have a character in the film called Samya and the platform um, gives you recommendations as to which actress, uh, which actors would be suitable for this role. You get a, you know, a very precise calculation of how, uh, of the match rate. So I guess uh, Carolina Herforth is, you know, 94.5% match and you would want to hire this, uh, this actor for this role. Um, and again, you know, these are processes that have been in place in the film industry. This is the gut feeling that I was talking about before, a gut feeling for which actor would be most suitable for a role, a gut feeling for... Um, you know, the rhythm of a story or the, the genre makeup of a story. But these companies here are, you know, combining your gut feeling with artificial intelligence, right? It's again, promising and offering accuracy, you know, offering data as a kind of backup to support your decisions. Uh, very important thing that they mentioned is that it's not here to replace the human in the decision making, but rather to support um, the human producer in making those decisions about which films to green light, which actors to hire, which directors to hire for a team, um, where to release a film, all of these decisions now backed up with solid data, as they claim. Um, another company, this is from Denmark, Publikum, is quite different and I, in my view, fairly unique. Uh, what they focus on is sort of uh, providing audience insights for film, product, uh, film producers. Um, and I literally sat in on one of their meetings with one of their clients just yesterday here in Amsterdam. Um, and I you know, witnessed the discussions, I witnessed the, the presentation, and I think it was really very interesting. So here, it's not just a platform, it's not just an algorithm, uh, but they use uh, sort of um, AI tools to produce data, which is then analyzed by you know, people in the company who have you know, backgrounds in film or anthropology or sociology to think about you know, what are some of the themes, uh, topics that people are thinking about or talking about? And what you do as a film producer is to, you know, again, go to them with your film. You tell them, okay, I'm making a film about um, a famous artist. It's a film that's going to be aimed at young audiences. And I want to know whether young audiences in Denmark and um, uh, the United Kingdom, are they going to watch this film? You know, are they going to empathize with the story? So what the publicum does is to go out there and, you know, sort of scrape all of that data from social media, from news articles, from blog posts, from uh, discussion fora, to synthesize all of that data and to throw back to the producers, you know, these are the things that people are thinking about in terms of, you know, artists or... Uh, artists who are outsiders and their insights help to support the, the the writers and the producers in you know tweaking the story perhaps or finding a way to market the film uh, in an effective way to the intended audience um, and what's interesting here in the case of Publicum is that they very emphatically say we are not a tech company. We put people before computers. We are using AI to support anthropology and not the other way around. And here they've kind of identified how, you know, there have been companies like Synalytic, like uh, Lago, who are very interested in the data analytics, the business intelligence part of things, you know, predicting the potential sale of a film. But 
what their USP is, right? What their unique selling point is, is to identify themes that are that resonate with audiences, right? And they're going to bring that uh, insight to you uh, as the filmmaker. So there are a very interesting case study of how you know uh, AI is being used in a very specific way that doesn't sort of take away from the human element in this decision making uh, context. So these are just some com uh, companies that we. We've been looking at that we're really interested in. Uh, these are some of the more high profile ones, I would say. Publicum, for example, are working very closely with the Danish Film Institute and many other national film institutes across Europe. They have the support of the um, EU's Creative Europe Fund. Um, Largo has been quite influential. They've been going to the Cannes Film Festival, Venice, you know, San Sebastian. Um, and you know, holding pitch sessions where they, you know, basically showcase their platform uh, and allow filmmakers, producers to try their product and you know, do a live demos and so on. That they're, they're at the film festivals every year. Cinelytic has a partnership with Warner Brothers, and that was made, you know, public, and that sort of threw people off their chairs when it was announced back in 2020, I believe that Warner Brothers is now using AI. I mean, in 2020, in the olden days, this was unthinkable. But today, I feel that, you know, it's almost expected that uh, film companies, big or small, would, you know, they're expected to kind of already engage with this uh, to an extent. And for us, what's interesting to look at is, you know, what precisely is the impact here? Um, is it changing the way you know decisions are being made? Is it changing the way uh, people work in this decision making process? Is it uh, changing the way people create uh, in the film context? And this is important because many of the companies do sort of uh, either directly or indirectly make the claim that we are going to boost creativity. Right? We're helping you automate all of this boring stuff so that you have more time to be creative. Uh, that's the kind of underlying uh, argument here. So automation is argued as something of a liberative, uh, liberation right? for, for the workers, right? that uh, we're going to free up time, uh, reduce the time that you spend on low value tasks, reduce the cognitive load on you, so that you can spend more time on high value creative tasks and creative decisions, thereby helping to support creativity in the industry. This is coming from Synalytics uh, Frequently Asked Questions site. So um, that kind of is the basis for our project, you know, and these are the questions that we want to ask. How exactly do film practitioners engage with these tools? How do they negotiate their creative agency when it comes to automation? And will the increasing reliance on these tools influence the economic aspects, technical, aesthetic aspects of film production? Um, and we acknowledge that this is a reality, right? That, that filmmakers are increasingly using these tools, whether it's generative or you know, the data intelligence side of things. Um, how is that going to change things? Will it change things at all? And what's also important for us to look at is to think about what kind of social technical imaginaries surround this idea of creative AI and how are they shaped by the designed uh, and application of these AI technologies. So very simply, what is the impact of creative AI automation tools in film production? That's our research question. So because creativity is um, you know, a huge part of this or is an intrinsic part of the, 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 the selling point of these tools, but also in the way people use these tools, creativity is kind of at, almost at the heart of um, this relationship between the tools or between AI and um, the filmmakers. And this is something that is not just, you know, uh, situated within the film context, but obviously we, we've seen it in music, in uh, visual arts, in painting, for example, in literature. 
this idea of um, creative machines, right? That AI can produce art, it can make art. And we're seeing all of these discussions out in the public realm, uh, in the academic space as well. What does it mean for creativity? Claims that AI has a creative side. Um, lots of media uh, articles and discussions about, you know, can machines create? And if so, who is the creator? You know, is it the human or is it the machine? Um, there's obviously been a backlash against this uh, with, you know, chat GPT and other such uh, generative tools um, that there is still a resistance against, you know, wholesale adoption of AI when it comes to uh, the production of culture. And very famously, Nick Cave responded to a, a song that was written in the style of Nick Cave, written by ChatGPT. Nope, it sucks, says Nick Cave. Um, so all these fears, all these discussions are out there. At the same time, there are a lot of uh, very positive views of this, right? That um, AI can bring about some kind of innovation in in, um, the creation of art, that uh, AI-powered creativity can be something that is, you know, that has huge potential that can really extend um, our perspectives about the world and about the way we see ourselves. So these are books um, that argue for, you know, a real, uh, a real embrace of AI technologies in, in creative um, art making. So there's this tension um, and creativity, you know, is kind of seen as the last differential, differential of human exceptionalism, right? And there are three ways of thinking about this as a kind of Promethean anxiety that, you know, um, uh, machines are now taking over, right? Machines are going to take away what is essentially human about um, us. Right? And that is the ability to create, the ability to think novel thoughts, the ability to, um, to, to innovate. There's also another strand of thought that says, um, you know, we are already machine-like in the way that we create. We're all kind of cybernetic uh, beings. Huh? The fact that we're using computers, um, various machines, right, or tools, we're already a machine. So there's no point in trying to differentiate between us and uh, AI, for example, because we're all the same thing, that we work the same way. Um, another strand of thought goes along the kind of transhuman fantasies, right? That AI is going to extend our human abilities to create. It's going to uh, boost you know, our creativity indeed. It will... Um, you know, make us even better when it comes to telling stories or creating images and so on. Um, so a lot of these discussions are very much centered on this question of what is creativity, right? Is it something essentially human? Is it, you know, a, a kind of me mental faculty that we possess? Um, but in our project, we want to try and actually move away from this, this question and this debate, because for us, we want to see creativity as something that is very material, that is very relational. Um, and so we want to shift to this question of, um, you know, from what is creativity to where is creativity? And here we are adopting the, the, the approach that creativity is something that is um, an operation within a system, right? A system's view of creativity. And that means looking at <clears throat> uh, the various aspects within this milieu, right? looking at institutions, looking at the culture, looking at the practices. Um, and we are quite fond of uh, Lia Lifrau's um, uh, concept of mediation and remediation here. This is a framework for understanding how, um, you know, the constitutive elements of new media technology that um, there are all these different elements to think of when we analyze new media texts, that there are artifacts, the text itself, right, that there are practices, um, you know, you can think of this in terms of like the production, and then there are arrangements, and here the social arrangements, we think about the discourses and the audiences 
that um, consume and produce these texts. So we've kind of adapted this um, into our very, oh, sorry, I should say this, um, sorry. Um, yeah, just focusing on the artifacts assumes a kind of technological determinism, right? That the that AI or you know computers are the end all and be all of of production. Um, and you know, I think what's important to note in this this um, this this graph is that you know we need to consider all three elements in a constant mode of repositioning. Um, and this is what we've adapted uh, here in our very crude model. And this is to think of creativity as existing in the relations between these these poles, as you were, as it were. Um, creativity is is a it's a process. It's a positioning. It's something that's material and something that's uh, relational, happening in the inst interstices between these various elements. And that's kind of the theoretical. Um, approach that we want to take. Um, so between social arrangements and technologies, we want to focus on the idea of automation. Uh, between social arrangements and practices, we want to look specifically at creative labor. Um, and we want to think about agency right, uh, as something that's distributed between technologies and practices. So, okay, on to the kind of more empirical method, methodological stuff. What we call our method is a technography, and this is something we've borrowed from um, Tanya Bucher, uh, who wrote in you know, her very famous book, If When. Um, so again, following on from the, the sort of theoretical framework there, what we will look at, or what we are looking at rather in our research right now is to really think about the technologies, these various AI tools. Um, here we're working with colleagues in computer science to help us understand a little bit more about what are the operational logics and the affordances of these creative tools. How, how does it work? How do they, you know, what kinds of knowledge do they produce and assume? Um, there's also the social arrangements that we're looking at, and that is to look at the kind of discursive uh, context, right? The discursive um, environment in which these artifacts, these uh, tools and users exist. We want to look at the way, you know, users talk about these tools, how um, the press, the media, how the film industry um, assigns value to these tools, for instance. Um, we also want to look very closely at practices, and that means looking at people's uh, filmmakers, uh, very intimate relationships with this technology. As I said, we're looking at how they are using these tools, but also, you know, what are their feelings towards these tools? What kind of relationships are they building with these tools? How is power and agency uh, distributed uh, between, you know, the human and the, the tool itself? Um, we've just started our field work sometime last month where this is a year long project for us, but we're going to extend this to um, look at other geographical regions for now we're focused on Europe. Uh, we've been conducting interviews with um, various film practitioners, producers, screenwriters, editors, um, you know, visual artists. Uh, based in the UK, the Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, and Denmark. Uh, we're also conducting uh, participant observation at various industry events. One of them is this uh, huge uh, film festival happening in Barcelona this June. Uh, it's the Plus Rain Film Festival and apparently, you know, the first AI film festival in Europe. Uh, it's combined with a kind of... Um, conference uh, element as well and we will be speaking there too but I think this um, space you know this event will be something quite interesting to analyze in terms of how the industry is engaging with uh, the question of AI and how the, the tech companies are, present themselves publicly in these situations um, what kinds of values and discourses on creativity are circulated within these events? Uh, how is um, creativity negotiated in this context? 
Um, so as I said, we've just started and we've spoken to about uh, seven um, film practitioners now. So I can share with you some preliminary insights, some really fascinating things that they've uh, shared with us. And uh, one of the things is time. So in our interview, you know, we, we tried to ask this question, you know, does using these tools, uh, you know, help you save time? You know, is it freeing up time for you? And because this is one of the claims made by these tech companies, right, that automation grants workers more time to be creative or, you know, through the speeding up of the, the data analytics. Um, it's helping you to, you know, uh, take time away from the mundane tasks, helps you to contribute time towards more creative tasks. And what um, the respondents have shared with us is that, yes, to an extent, it does sort of speed things up, which is good in a sense. But learning to use these tools, learning about the operational logics of these tools, that takes time. Um, a Portuguese filmmaker we spoke to said, you know, every night he's just watching YouTube videos upon YouTube videos, learning how to use, you know, specific uh, image generation tools. Um, and when he sort of thinks about, you know, his pre-AI time and his post-AI, uh, you know, production process, it all evens out. In fact, he's actually spending way more time on YouTube learning to use the different tools because there are always new tools coming up. Um, and that's actually taking away valuable time from the creative process itself. Um, even learning, so learning how to use these tools, learning how to prompt uh, the AI tools, how to prompt the algorithm to produce the image that you want, for instance, that takes time because you prompt, you generate something, then you need to re-prompt it to generate something else. And even when that's done, you still need to kind of tweak the image a little bit. So that's all taking up a fair bit of time. For some Spanish filmmakers we spoke to, you know, they're super involved in adapting these tools and even coding a little bit themselves to tweak the tools. And that experimentation, that, you know, time spent writing the programs, that's also taking a lot of time. And this uh, is... It's very much linked with this second idea of ownership. This was the second theme that popped up a lot, um, which is very uh, individual, highly subjective. Uh, for some filmmakers, you know, using these generative AI tools meant that the production process was too fast. And as a consequence, they didn't feel any love for their film. They didn't feel like this was their baby. You know, they didn't spend eight months just perfecting this one scene um, or, you know, writing and rewriting this character or, you know, you know, all that time spent contributes to a sense of ownership, a sense of um, sort of authorship, right, uh, of, of really owning this, this, this artifact. But using AI for them, meant that everything just happened within a few minutes or, you know, hours, and that was it. So that time was necessary, you know, time spent on the production was really necessary for this sense of ownership, and AI for them is taking that element away. Um, but for some other uh, filmmakers we spoke to, for example, in the UK, um, the being able to use these tools was a kind of liberation for them. It was a kind of um, democratization as well, be, because now it's much easier for anyone to make a film, to you know, uh, produce even just a short film with as as few people as possible, cheaply, uh, for free. Even the only thing spent is your time and your labor. So for these filmmakers, it was a sense of pride that they that the that the use of AI generated in them right? that this was mine. You know, I was able to make this film, uh, says one of the filmmakers. Um, and that links to the idea of labor and the nature of film labor in our study. Uh, we're learning that. Uh, people are having to adopt new skills, right, or to learn to be able to 
uh, prompt the, uh, you know, something like chat GPT or mid journey, for instance. So prompt engineering is becoming almost a key skill that is required. Um, and uh, it's, it's, there's also a kind of shift in the sense that uh, for visual artists, for example, they are not so much creating images from scratch anymore, but rather they are doing very specific articulation work. So the AI has generated an image or a sequence, a video sequence, and their labor, their work is to, you know, refine it, to make it a little bit better, to articulate the the, the product a little bit more or to clean up things or retouch things, for instance. Um, in some other cases, we learn that uh, specific roles are indeed being replaced. So specific types of film labor are being replaced. For instance, subtitling, a lot of that is now automated. Um, so, you know, people don't hire uh, translators or subtitlers anymore. Um, uh, and last thing uh, so far that we've learned is that there is a real, um, there are different approaches to this question of perspective. So on the one hand, um, tools like Synalytic or Largo, uh, they reconfirm your gut feeling, right? They're providing data to kind of um, confirm your gut feeling, but at the same time, it can be a very narrowing process of, um, of perspective, right? That, that, it simply just confirms things and doesn't quite suggest uh, ideas for expansion, for instance, um, providing a kind of quantified perspective to something that's already, you know, inherent. Um, for the generative tools, uh, the use of generative tools, indeed, there is some sense of a, an expanded perspective that um, new ideas can be created. Um, for example, with Publicum, you know, the data and the insights that are produced through from the company for the writers and producers, it's, you know, like providing a, a, a feedback in a different way or research in a different way is helping them see that audiences, you know, from this specific cultural context prefer stories about this or um audiences in this cultural context think about this issue in this way, which is different from how they might have thought or assumed before. So in that sense, there is some expansion of perspective indeed. Um, and these are just, you know, all of these themes here that I've listed are various dimensions in which labor, uh, sorry, creativity is uh, negotiated and mediated. And it is, you know, we're seeing that there is a real kind of, um, uh, movement in terms of how creativity is negotiated as something that is inherent through the use of tools or through sort of like the human uh, uh, the human uh, practitioner's sort of um, use of these tools, um, the kinds of feelings that are generated by this, the kinds of ownership, uh, feelings of ownership and, you know, the very practical and material replacement of labor or changing of uh, labor, all of that kind of um, sort of mediates this sense of how AI can be creative in very specific ways. So this is all work that's still ongoing. Um, we're hoping to meet with and, and talk with uh, even more, especially when we get to Barcelona, I think we'll be meeting with tons and tons of filmmakers and producers. It'll be really interesting to see what else comes out. Um, I think the last thing I just want to say is, you know, why does it matter whether we can identify where creativity is, right? What is at stake here? And I think this question of creativity and AI is so important to talk about and to research. It's because, you know, we think of creative works as uh, something, that, something that's being attributed to a natural person, right? whether it's someone who's living or dead, but a natural person. And from this, you know, one derives copyright, compensation, someone gets paid at the end of the day, and this matters, right? Film, uh, public film agencies, national film institutes are really grappling with this idea of authorship and rights when it comes to using AI tools. Um, you know, to whom does uh, the right belong to if a film was generated even partially with AI? 
uh, for production companies, it's a question of labor and costs, right? Who do we pay? You know, if I, as a producer, instructed you as a visual artist to generate something with AI, I could potentially make the argument that I'm going to pay you less because you're not really, you know, the creator of this thing. And it's uh, you're using an AI tool that I bought, that I paid for. So I'm not going to pay you any any more than uh, what I think your work is worth, right? So the question of value and labor is very much important here. Um, in film schools, right, they're also discussing this, what precisely do we teach our students now? I mean, of course, we'll teach them how to use a camera, how to, um, how to manage a film project, but, you know, are they going to have to teach prompt engineering? Are they going to have to teach, um, you know, other sort of skill sets relating to coding and to programming? in order for the students to be future ready, to be able to use AI tools uh, in the media environment, which is a very real um, uh, phenomenon right now. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're really excited about this project. We're, we're learning so much from our conversations. Um, and I'd love to also hear from you guys in the audience about, you know, your thoughts on this and Maybe some of you are, are, are filmmakers yourselves or film practitioners in various roles. And I'd love to hear your experiences about this. Um, so I'll, I'll end here. I realize we're actually out of time, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Claudio and I have a mailing list in which we kind of, um, you know, we, we advertise events that we're organizing a seminar series as well. Um, so please get in touch. Uh, but for now, I will, yeah, I'll end here and thank you all so much for your attention.